On the conference uh, reacting transcultural feminism and women's heritage, uh, we visited uh, one of the uh, keynote lectures was uh, titled uh, On Post-Soviet Imaginary and Global Coloniality, a Gendered Perspective. It was uh, by Madina Kristanova, a professor of literature and history in Moscow, uh, who is dealing uh, in her work uh, with the post-colonial gender and uh, Euro-Asian ethnic studies. Uh, so, uh, Martina, in your lecture, you spoke about the uh, colonization of uh, feminist discourse. And uh, my question goes to this direction. Uh, how is feminist discourse colonialized, colonialized today? And uh, um, uh, what are the possibilities for its uh, decolonialization? Mm -hmm. And uh, in other words, um, does the, the feminism or the feminisms today have uh, on the both on the global and the, the local scale uh, potential to be agents of social change. Okay, Thanks. thank you. It's a great question. Well, to make a long story short, um, coloniality of feminism, uh, as any other Western discipline, um, is part of the global coloniality, uh, which is a phenomenon that started in the 16th century with colonization of the New World, uh, together with colonialism as a historical thing, as we know it, but then when colonialism disappeared uh, from the uh, political map, uh, almost disappeared today, uh, coloniality is still there. It's a bondage of modernity, let's say. It's an epistemic bondage, economic bondage, also because it's linked with capital, not necessarily capitalism, but capital. Uh, and it's uh, also um, a principle that was um, made uh, a major one, the, the leading one in the 16th century, and from 16th century on, uh, it's always repeated in various forms. It's a principle of dividing the humanity according uh, to certain rules and pigeonholing people, countries, uh, religions, uh, various kinds of sexualities uh, also, and various kinds of gender, uh, according to a principle, according to a set of principles, let's say. Uh, that is connected with Western modernity, with Christian, white, uh, Western modernity. Uh, and later, in the second uh, part of modernity, after the Enlightenment, this principle um, it, it takes different forms. First, it, it's uh, in the form of uh, Christianization, going hand in hand with capitalism. Then, uh, after the circularization comes, then uh, it takes different other forms, like, uh, for example, the civilizing discourse that we're all familiar with. Uh, then in Cold War uh, times, in the 20th century, it's uh, the so-called developing countries. And so the, the principle is always what? It's very simple. There is modernity, uh, and the Western people inhabit modernity, and this is the, uh, the zero point, the zero point epistemology, let's say, from which we go, and from which all the disciplines are shaped, and uh, all... Um, you know, starting points are being made. And then there is uh, different others, and one of the basic ideas of otherness in modernity is tradition. So everything that is not modern is traditional. Uh, for example, les anciennes et les modernes, right? So uh, already in the Renaissance, you see that the people of Renaissance, they see themselves as the moderns, while uh, they invent the idea of uh, prehistory of Europe, let's say, the, the dark Middle Ages. So they see this difference already within Europe, but then they start, uh, during the colonization period, they start to project it to other places. And so it happens, uh, a very interesting thing happens, like the colonization of space by time. Because in modernity, what is ruling is time. If you think about all the main theoretical books written in modernity by the main Western philosophers, they always uh, circulate around the idea of time. And so feminism in that uh, respect I mean, it's very important, of course, and we cannot forget about Western feminism. But it traces the Western genealogy, the Western genealogy of thoughts, uh, and Western history of Western women, uh, and of course, when uh, the so-called third world feminism and women of color feminism emerges, and different other kinds of feminisms that we have today, they simply refuse to just assume that there is some universal idea of women that everybody has to follow, that there is some basic uh, you know, idea of gender that everybody has to accept. And so, um, uh, what, we, what I was speaking about was decolonization of gender because uh, there is a coloniality of gender that was also imposed as part of the massive 
uh, coloniality that you find in different other areas, like coloniality of being, coloniality of knowledge, uh, who produces knowledge for whom, how it is, uh, they distribute it, and who is allowed to produce knowledge and who is not. Uh, and the same was uh, in gender area, where there were fixed positions uh, of, of all kinds of genders that existed, but some people were uh, refused to, to have gender. They were not allowed to have gender. They were assigned only to biological sex. And uh, unfortunately today the situation uh, re-emerges in different other ways. Uh, as you know, for example, in, in uh, uh, women trafficking, right? Uh, in all those dispensable lives, of uh, most of which are women lives, that we have all around the globe today. So it is important to decolonize from the Western idea of gender, uh, and um, that's what I was uh, trying to show. Uh, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, my um, next question mm -hmm. uh, deals with the uh, socialist heritage, heritage. heritage. and um, so uh, it's like, uh, how can socialist uh, genealogies and uh, mm -hmm. socialist genealogies of women's struggle mm -hmm. uh, be constructive in thinking feminist social, political and cultural alternatives? Mm -hmm. And how can we bring socialist feminism in as a critic of the mainstream co-opted mm -hmm. feminism and as a necessary form? Mm -hmm. I think it is a very important issue to raise because um, in many post-socialist countries what happened was that feminists started once again from scratch. They chose to forget about uh, this heritage and this genealogy that they had before. Or as I use this metaphor by Chinese uh, women activists, they said we don't want to walk the path that, we, that you were assigned to, to us and we don't want to wear Western shoes that are not comfortable for our feet because we had our own way. And I think it's true also about uh, former Yugoslavia, it's true about other places in uh, Eastern Europe and uh, Southeastern Europe. Uh, and even, even in Russia, although of course Russia was unlucky in that respect because all the feminists were kind of forbidden in the early 1920s by the Bolsheviks, because when the Bolsheviks realized that it was really a powerful thing, they decided that they would, uh, you know, they would say officially uh, in their rhetoric that, okay, the women question was solved, we're done with it, so we don't need any more women organizations, or we don't need, need any more any feminism. Feminism is a bourgeois thing. Yeah, so it's an interesting interplay of different discourses here. But I think why is important? Because we have two different kinds of modernity in the 20th century. We have Western capitalist, now neoliberal modernity, and then we have socialist statist variant. Uh, but both of them are uh, cousins, let's say, because they share certain vices of modernity, like, for example, the vice that I mentioned, this, this clash between modernity and tradition. Uh, this uh, craze of uh, progressivism, newness, you know, uh, and also the uh, awful attitude to nature and um, different other vices. But it's just that they differed ideologically, but they were very similar in, in, their, in their ways uh, of imposing the truth onto the rest of the world and trying to make, uh, by force, other people accept it. And so I think that so socialist heritage is, is important uh, historically, I mean genealogically, because we have to see these different paths modernity takes. But it's also important because I think in socialist kinds of modernity, there were m more nuanced ways of expressing uh, uh, women's uh, position when they were not uh, in agreement with the state, when they were not in agreement with nation state especially. Uh, but of course, in, in some countries, like, like in the Soviet Union, uh, most of these resistance movements were crashed uh, uh, totally. I mean, people were killed, uh, people were destroyed. Uh, although in some colonies, in some Soviet colonies, uh, there uh, still are and uh, there have continued to be tradition of this alternative thinking, which are especially well demonstrated in the arts, I think, today, in literature.